off our second day in the theater at Arrival, we have CEOs and founders of four reservation system companies to discuss the state of technology and what's next for the best part of travel. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chris Atkin, CEO of ResD, Ruzwana Bashir, co-founder and CEO of Peak, Jason Morehouse, co-founder and CEO of Checkfront, and Max Valverde, CEO of Fair Harbor. Coming around me. Welcome. Well, so I've, I've been wanting to do this session for a long time at Arrival because, well, since we started, I guess, three years ago, so that's a long, it's a long time in startup years, right, as, as all of you guys uh, know very well. Um, so I, I just would like to, just to give everyone a sense of who each of you are, your companies and your place in the ecosystem. Uh, so uh, very quickly, kind of when you were founded, uh, number of employees, where you're, where you're headquartered, uh, headquartered, Chris? Uh, sure. Yeah, so um, for Resty, we were founded eight years ago. We just uh, had our eighth um, birthday celebration. Uh, started in Sydney by two Frenchmen. Uh, we're just about 90 people today. 90 people. And I think that probably answered all your questions. Yeah, that's fantastic. But you have two offices in the US as well, Yeah, right? two offices in the US. So based in Sydney uh, with probably about half the team. And then uh, Las Vegas and Raleigh in North Carolina. Great, great. Rizwan? Um So with Peak, we uh, started in 2012. Um, started by a Brit and a German, obviously in San Francisco, which would make a lot of sense. So we started the business there. We're about uh, 175 people. Wow. Um, and we've got offices in San Francisco, Utah, and New York. Wow. And Jason? Yeah, so we started in uh, 2010. Um, we're based in Victoria, BC, Canada. And the team's about just uh, 80 people. Nice. Yeah. And Max? Um, with Fair Harbor, we started in 2013. Uh, we have uh, over 600 employees, offices in Sydney, San Francisco, Denver, Boston, and Amsterdam is where our headquarters are now. Uh, and so, uh, so first of all, just, just congratulations. I mean, uh, to starting a software company and lasting as long as you have and being successful, as you all know, and many of us here, it is not an easy thing uh, to do. So, uh, so congratulations. I know it's kind of hard fought uh, success uh, for sure. So, uh, Max, I want to start with you. The, perhaps the biggest issue, I think, in this world of reservation tech has been uh, the acquisitions of companies that took place, I think, uh, in the first quarter, second quarter of last year. Uh, so, Booking.com, Booking Holdings acquired, uh, Fair Harbor, TripAdvisor acquiring uh, Boken. So, I guess that's why headquarters have shifted a bit for you guys to, uh, to Amsterdam. Uh, so can you tell us a bit about the acquisition? Uh, what has that meant for, for Fair Harbor and for Fair Harbor's customers? Yeah, so Fair Harbor, two years ago, a, a report in Focusrite came out that we were uh, the largest in the world and basically booking at that point, uh, you know, we teamed up with them. Um, the, it, what it means is it's a vote of confidence from the largest travel company in the world that this industry is here to stay that this is going to be the future of travel. Um, you know, the Booking Holdings being the largest publicly traded uh, company in travel. And it means nothing but good things for Fair Harbor employees. They've let us remain entirely independent. Um, basically, Booking is a really mature travel company that understands that you know, we need to play fair and have very strong data privacy laws and nice anti-competition things. Uh, Expedia and TripAdvisor, get your guide. Everybody's very happy with us and the way that we've you know, conducted ourselves, remaining independent within booking. But um, I think what it means, it, what's a little bit larger for the industry and for people you know, out there in the, in the audience is thinking about what it means for the industry as time goes on. Um, basically, there's two ways to start a reservation software. You can go really low cost, low monthly fee situation, and you're a lifestyle business, and that's like a bookio, or maybe an indexic. And they're going to be around for a really long time. But then if you look uh, you know, into the history books of, of you know, companies like Zerve, who raised $34 million, they went out of business. You look at uh, you know, Zozi, who raised $60 million, and they went out of business. I mean, it's, it's a really tough game to play the other side, where you try to grow something really, really large. And it's, it's not easy, as everyone up here can attest. But eventually, you need to team up with someone big to kind of help 
not only bankroll you, but help you take it to the next level and learn how to scale to over, you know. So, but uh, there's also been a lot of questions <clears throat> and criticism about the acquisitions in the industry, uh, also from some of the reservation system companies that have not been acquired. So Jason, like, what do you think? Is the, these acquisitions, have they been good for the industry and for operators or not? Well, it's been good for Max and Yalti, but uh, uh, I think, I think, I think it's, uh, I mean, I agree with most of the comments there, but I, I think that there's a, a slight conflict in the way that it's been um, uh, aligned with the reservation systems and the OTAs who are our partners. Um, and I think that creates a little bit of confusion uh, and some anxiety from, from operators. So uh, what, what is that confusion and anxiety? Well, I mean, I think the other three of us are independent operators, so we get to set um, you know, our goals uh, based on our operators. Um, and the other two systems are, are kind of somewhat driven by um, the top level OTA, which I think, I think there's a conflict there that, that some people are uncomfortable with. Rizwana, what's your take on that? Would you agree? Uh, yeah, I think, I think the reason that a lot of operators have been talking about this issue and uh, that question was raised a lot um, is because um, people are concerned. They're concerned about their data and privacy. They're concerned about the pricing power that OTAs have exerted in other industries. So if you look in the history books, the history on hotels hasn't been great with OTAs. And so I think there's you know, deep concern from operators around uh, the power and influence a reservation system being owned by an OTA can have um, and how much your data could be utilized in the future, especially if you're getting more and more locked in. And so I think we see those concerns. I think those are genuine concerns um, that have been played out in other industries and having issues. And it's part of the reason that we really uh, appreciate being independent. I, I think that, you know, I'd agree that, you know, in order to invest in products, you want to make sure uh, that, you, that you're able to do that. We've raised about $50 million um, from some great investors in the Valley, you know, the founders of Google and Twitter. And that's but I think something helpful. that's more concerning, if you think about Zerve.com and when they went out of business, they were trying to run an OTA and be a res software under the same roof. And Peak.com also has an OTA arm where... Well, so you know, we're not an OTA, but we do work with Yelp and Groupon uh, in order to help you know, our operators to get distribution so can I, beyond... I want to ask, though, on, on the, so your, the, the concern around data sharing, can you be, so what is the specific concern? Is it that the OTA now has access to, um, to operators and data and can use that to their... And pricing patterns, uh, pricing patterns, uh, the data around buying behavior, um, customer data. So there's, there's a lot of areas of concerns that people have around that. And also not what's happening today and what, what is being committed to today, but what might happen over time. And, and there are, you know, tendencies for these things to change. And so that's the concern that we've heard from a lot of businesses. But honestly, Douglas, this, is, just, this is honestly just fear-mongering at this point. We're at a, at a large publicly traded company with data privacy lawyers surrounding us. Kayak.com resells Expedia all the time. Modern travel companies play together nicely. And just because we happen to be owned by the largest travel company that also owns Kayak.com, OpenTable, Priceline.com, Booking.com. It's just more inventory for the other OTAs to, to work with. It's also a, a, an act of a, a vote of confidence that we're going to be here for a long time, and Booking believes in our product roadmap to, you know. So the only one, pushback one, I'd say is that Get Your Guide did, um, the COO of Get Your Guide did come out talking about these issues and his concerns and in advising people to actually go with independent systems. So I do think there is a concern in the industry and there are people, including an OTA like Get Your Guide, who are coming out and making statements that they do have concerns. So I don't think everybody's aligned on that, but you know, I think it's, it's good that we're having the conversation so, so, so we can help so just it. So, and I do want to also, because there's a, with regard to Get Your Guide and there's Chris too, but just one quick follow-up just for Max. So with regard to, uh, to data sharing, does Fair Harbor share operator system kind of data with Booking.com in, in a way that... Um... Absolutely not. We have, we're on a completely different stack. We have Chinese walls set up and agreements that we have shared with all of our different OTA partners, how we would conduct business and how data will be used. We also have anti-competition lawyers, again, surrounding us, watching our every move. So there's, it's completely unfounded, and all it is is... Uh, you know, I don't know. I, I'll, that's all I'll say. Okay. So, so, uh, so, Chris. Well, I'm sure there's more to be said about this. Uh, so, Chris. So you. So, Resd is kind of in the 
the middle here a little bit. So, okay, you're independently owned. However, you are certainly aligned, right? So ResD and Booking Kit are part of this uh, Get Your Guide Preferred Partners program. Uh, so why are you doing this, and kind of what's and what's your take on this this debate? Yeah, look, I think that I think there's quite a difference between the two. I don't I don't see it as the middle. I think what we've done is formalized one of the many really strong relationships we have with the OTAs. Um, so we work very similarly with Get Your Guide as we do with Expedia, as we do with you know, a lot of the other OTAs. And so it's just formalized and, and put out there, which we're very happy to be a part of. Um, so I think it is quite different in that sense, you know, because we're there to, as an independent business to, um, to support all the suppliers that, that work on our system. But um, with, the, in, with the, the, the preferred partnership, like what do you do with your with those operators that are part of that partnership that's special for them as opposed to your other customers? I mean, the, the key part of the partnership really is making sure that the, the, the Get Your Guide teams in the field have got the information to be able to make a good recommendation. I think that the, the guys from Get Your Guide were keen to make sure it wasn't single businesses, and so there's obviously booking kit in there as well. And so they're, they're informed to be able to help someone make a, make a good decision. But I think they're, they're also happy to recommend other systems if they feel it's more suited. So I think the intent is to make sure the supplier is making the right decision. So uh, we did some work, and we identified about 150 reservation system companies in this industry. Then I think others have told us, well, we missed another 100 companies or so. Uh, so how many systems can this marketplace support, and is there going to be more consolidation. Rizwana? Um, I think that in the end, you know, there's a reason that you have only four of us on stage, right? Um, I think whenever you have any of these industries, people end up coalescing around a set of players that might have the most scale and also are investing the most in the product uh, in going out and, and working with as many businesses as possible. And so I think that, um, I think more of what what will happen is less consolidation and more just the growth in the industry. Um, the space is so large and there's so much opportunity for businesses um, to be coming online. I think the biggest thing that we're seeing is that um, operators really do need to come online. They, you need to have real-time inventory. You want to have a multi-channel approach where you're selling with lots of different people um, and also actually having a big presence on your own website. So I think, um, I think more of what we'll see is actually just the growth of, of, of the, the largest players uh, who I think will continue to scale. Um, I don't know that there's that much more consolidation to come um, because a lot of the smaller players are very small, as Max mentioned there. But there, but there has to be some change, though, yeah, because so you've, you've raised capital, you've raised capital. I think, I think Check Fund as well has raised other companies in Europe. So at some point, there has to be kind of exits or next steps for, for these companies. I can sum this up for you right here, and it sums up the last topic too. Right when, when the acquisitions happened, there was a lot of fear. And it was, wait a minute, how is Booking going to play? Are they going to do something sketchy with Fair Harbor and try to you know, use Fair Harbor to, to get ahead? That was unfounded, and that's why all the fear has kind of gone away. And at this point, they've, we've shown that Fair Harbor is going to play fair and run it like a, a grown-up hotel company. What ends up happening is all the exit opportunities are pretty much dried up. And like I said before, you can do a low, lean business, or you can go for the big, go for the big company. And that's what we've done. And it makes me think of something that Mark Cuban told me when we were talking about Fair Harbor. He said, when you run with the elephants, they're the fast and they're the dead. <laughs> Okay. Jason, is there going to be more consolidation? I'm not sure which, which elephant we are. <laughs> I, I, I think it's, I mean, I'm sure there's lots of exit opportunities that are out there. There's a ton of uh, interest in the space, uh, both from OTAs, but, you know, there's a, there's a lot of more kind of eyeballs on the space, and I think that's, uh, that's kind of untrue. Chris? Y yeah, look, I think that yeah, we've seen there's still so many operators that aren't online. There's so many parts of the world where people aren't connected and they're not trading with their partners in an automated way. So I think this is still very early in the, in the game. And I think that you know, there's, there's plenty of exits that will develop as the, as the market matures. Mm. But you know, I think the idea that big businesses are going to spend a lot of money and, and not look to utilize that asset for their own interests is, you know, is kind of a, a naive one. You know, we, we know that's going to happen. It's just a question of which way. Is it in pricing? Is it around? data? Is it around you know, preferred distribution? I think you know, that's, that's the question as, as a, an operator thinking around that software. You need, you need to think about how it's going to affect your business. So I want to open up for audience, audience questions. Um, so 
uh, next topic I'd like to address is pricing. Uh, there's been lots of changes in kind of pricing models over the years. So I believe, so ResD is a subscription-based pricing model? We're a hybrid, so probably, hybrid. Yeah, a small subscription fee and then a, an element of transaction that you can either charge on to the end consumer or uh, bear yourself as a supplier. So you've got that, that flexibility. Okay. And Rizwana, this is you. your model is the consumer kind of booking fee for website bookings. Is that correct? And, and Max Fair Harbor as well, it's the consumer booking fee for, uh, for website bookings. Correct. And so Jason, Checkfront had been subscription, I believe, in the past, but you've yeah. introduced uh, a, a different model. So what was your, can you walk us through that and what sure. was the reason for the change? Sure, I mean, we've been subscription-based uh, since the get-go. It's the, the model that we believe is most uh, operator-centric. Um, and why, why is that? I th it, it just makes more sense for stable businesses to pay a fixed fee, in our opinion. Um, and we have 5,000 operators that agree with that model around the world. Um, the, introduction of the introduction of the subscription plan was really just to capture the portion of the market that didn't yet want to pay um, user fees because they hadn't yet reached scale that, um, that, that made sense for that. So we see it as kind of a, an entry-level plan where operators who are just getting up and running, they're just you know, starting their business, um, they don't want to get a, they don't want to get a bill, they don't want to get an invoice, they're not yet ready to commit to a subscription. Um, we allow them to start on a, on a kind of convenience fee-based model um, to, you know, hopefully they'll eventually convert over to a subscription. What I, find, what I find interesting, though, is that every one of you on stage and most other reservation softwares, when we started Fair Harbor, we were the booking fee from the beginning, the only one doing it, and everyone said, that's horrible, that's going to ruin your business, Jason, you had a white paper that you took down off your website recently saying how horrible booking fees are. Now everyone's coming to the booking fee, and at the beginning, at the beginning of Fair Harbor, we weren't smart. We didn't do it because we we're smart guys. We just chose a booking fee, and it created our DNA of being invested in growing our clients year over year. So Max, here's so one one question that was actually submitted by an operator in advance uh, said, uh, "Why don't you consider?" offering multiple pricing models, uh, and several specifically said we might consider using Fair Harbor, but we don't want to have the consumer booking because, fee. So why don't you offer the option? Yeah, because it is who we are. Our DNA is growing our clients year over year. When I'm looking at 2020 guidance and I need to tell booking holdings how much money we're going to make, and I need to juice it up 20%, I don't think about how we can squeeze our clients. I think about how can we grow our clients' online bookings by 20%, and let's pump some tools into our clients to grow them. If you're a monthly fee software, anytime someone calls into support, that is an expense for you. When someone calls into support for us, our 24-7 support, this is an opportunity to help you grow. It's just in our DNA. So if you start as a monthly fee software where customer support is a is a cost item, it's in your OPEX, it, it's very hard to transition. And what I'd like to know is why people, why you guys you know, finally decided to switch over and uh, to, you know, to the booking fee and why you whacked it for so many years. So, so just, well, first, I want to let Jason respond, but then we'll... we'll yeah, so uh, the subscription fee is, or the, the booking fee is not our, our recommended uh, option. And so when people are coming in and they're, they're, they're asking for optionality uh, in, in pricing and business models. The, the, the booking fee is not the one that we recommend. These are not, as we know and most people in the room, high margin businesses. So we feel that if a customer is willing to pay $106 instead of $100 for a tour, most of that should go to the operator and not the booking system. Um, we just feel fundamentally in our DNA as well that um, there is some unfairness there when you reach reasonable scale. But what happens if that company was doing $1.8 million on their website before Fair Harbor? The next year, they do $4.5 million. Well, we have the same use cases. We have the same case studies of the customers that have come in and tripled their business on a subscription plan. Rizwana, so what's your response to Max's comment about kind of the switch? Oh, we've been using the, we've had a booking fee for years. Um, I think it aligns incentives. Um, it's one of the reasons we've been really innovative in our products, and it means that we've focused a lot on conversion optimization um, of the booking flow and a lot of features that actually enhance uh, a merchant's growth. So typically, businesses that work with us will see their revenues grow 15 to 20 percent every year based on the work that we're doing on the back end. So it really aligns us and it allows us to put a lot of resources into the technology. Um, and I think that that's really been a huge 
you know, a huge way in which we've been able to add to merchants. We were named one of Fast Company's most innovative companies in travel, and a lot of that innovation is because we're aligned around how is it that we can make um, companies grow and we can give them tools that really matter to them. And it really is about driving additional revenue. Um, and so I think um, that's the reason we've been using it for years, and I think it's, it's a, the right model. It's a win-win. I also think it's great when businesses um, are impacted by seasonality. So you're not having to pay lots when your business isn't very busy. Um, and I think a lot of, there's a lot of talk of recession. And next year, I think one of the things that you know, a booking fee does is that if there is a recession and, and, and for some reason your business isn't doing as well, you know that you know, you're not going to be having to pay this fixed fee that's large. right? So I think there's lots of ways in which it's very flexible. Uh, and it's a win-win for businesses. And Chris, so, you, so you're sticking with subscriptions? Well, I say we've got the hybrid. So um, you know, there's a small subscription fee. Uh, which probably accounts for about a third in general of what people pay, and about two thirds is based on um, a transaction fee. As I say, that can be charged on to the end consumer, or it can be borne by the, the customer. So we just give them flexibility. I mean, we, there's no right or wrong fee. You know, ultimately the suppliers, you know, what, being an independent business, we can give them the choice, and that's what we look to do. Um, and then how they want to play it out themselves is, is really up to them. And I think that you know, the, the thing that we, you know, similarly to, to Jason said, you know, the idea that you could have charged the customer 6% more than you are charging. Um, and you don't have the ability to choose whether to suffer only a couple of percent of that to pay a different booking software you know, is, is a decision that the supplier can make. But you know, we, we think that it does sink in with the idea of giving a level of um, sort of joint focus in what we're doing so that we're helping them grow both their direct sales, but you know, we have a very extensive um, set of channels on, on the distribution side as well. And we help a business to grow that way as well because we you know, we're, we're um, ambivalent as to how that business grows. So there are more than 100 companies uh, in this world of reservation software. How does an operator go about choosing uh, between the 150 plus? So Chris, you know, what, what guidance would you give to an operator who's, who's evaluating a system? I mean, uh, you guys have done a fantastic job in the last couple of arrivals of having sessions that give you know, really good advice. I think they've been great sessions. Um, I think really stopping and thinking about what your needs are you know, is, is the first thing. You know, be really, really clear. What's a non-negotiable that you need to have? And then what is something you can live without? Because anyone that tells you they're going to solve all your problems, they're probably not telling you the truth. Because you know, we work really hard with the, the features that we develop, but there's so many different types of needs. The walking tour has a completely different need from the, the helicopter tour. And so therefore, you can't, however sophisticated the system, solve all problems. So be really, really clear about what you need. Um, and then thoroughly research. Go and talk to other businesses that are using that software. Do some free trials. Um, stop and think about the pricing plan and what works best for you. And then you know, when, when you've done that assessment, dive in there and, and, um, and stick with it. And you probably will have made a good decision. Yeah. Ruzwana, do you have a perspective on that? What would advice would you give to Yeah, I think it's just defining your priorities, right? Um, a lot of you know, what we hear from businesses is they want to improve the customer experience. And that, great, if you're improving your customer experience and you've got a lot of paper waivers, then great, you want a system um, that integrates the waivers and, and, and doesn't have additional fees for that. Or you, um, you care a lot about improving your customer experience, you want really great business intelligence tools. So I think it's really just thinking through um, what your priorities are. You know, for a lot of what we hear from businesses is, I want to get more bookings directly from my website. So you want marketing integrations, you want to make sure um, you're getting a lot, you know, smart reviews we have, you know, to help you get more reviews and things like that. So I think it's really just defining like what your two or three biggest priorities are, and then making sure the systems patch in for that, and they have the functionality you need um, to optimize for that. Okay, so we have a question from the audience. <clears throat> yeah, my name's Torin. I'm with the Flying Bike in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, and for the record, we use Fair Harbor. Um, I just, first of all, wanted to comment and say thank you guys for this heated debate. It's probably been the most fun session I've been at the entire time. So it's been exciting. And, and it makes, I think it makes me as, a, as an operator feel wanted, um, seeing you guys go at it with so much fire. And I guess, <clears throat> I guess then the, the point I'm that I want to bring sure up. The, what's that? I'm pretty sure you're wanted. Yeah. And so the point that I want to bring up or ask and throw out to you guys to comment on is, you know, could you reduce your rates? <laughs> how, do, Matt, how do you reduce the rates on a free software? I'm sorry? How do you reduce the rates on well, a free software? I'll, I'll take that since you're on, you're on Fair Harbor. Um, it, it's, 
basically what you need to believe, and I think that you do, is that every year that you're with a company that is on a booking fee, that that booking fee company is putting as much time, energy, and money into growing your business year over year. If you look at the, the foundation of the company that you're, that, you're, that you're with, thinking about are they going to be around for a long period of time, and what are their motivations? Our model is set up on that 6% booking fee, and, and everyone else here has their pricing models. It's basically our, our 600 employees are not here for anything else to help you than to help you grow. And it's, it's in there. It's, it's baked into their, their payroll there. So I mean, so, well, let's, I, can I, I think that was a no, just to be yeah. clear. It's definitely a no. OK. Yeah. Jason, uh, how about you? Well, I mean, just to add to that, I mean, are, are we growing operators' businesses or are we growing res tech? And I think there's a bit of a, of a, of a gray line when it comes to how much uh, consumers are paying, which we believe fundamentally is operators' margin and revenue. Um, we, we start at 49 bucks a month, uh, and we've been in business for almost 10 years. So we're not, we're not going anywhere. We're, we're fully sustainable, and we've raised like but 10 percent of what has been okay, raised. Okay, but you're screen. not. But you're not going to reduce your. Okay. So with our flex plan, there is optionality in in the in the fee that's there. So yes, we will if you speak with us. So you have one more question from the audience, I think, over here. Hi, Lisa with Catalina Food Tours and Catalina Tours. Um, the thing that we've been talking about this week has been that change is inevitable, and it seems that most tour operators at some point would need to switch from one company to another. I wondered what your process is and how your companies deal with that change, and specifically wondered if Fair Harbor had stopped the process of holding reservations hostage when companies try to change from them. Max, you want to start with that? Yeah, can you elaborate on uh, holding the reservations hostage? Sure. sure. Uh, we used to work with you for Catalina Tours, which is an OTA that we have on Catalina Island in California. And when we decided to change to a different company, we were locked out of systems and told that all reservations would be refunded. And it was only under threat of legal action that we were able to then gain access and get a report of those sales. About 350 reservations uh, while our owner's husband was in the hospital and I was dealing with the operation myself. Oh, I, I actually remember this coming in. So thank you for, for the question. Basically, it's, 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 it's just a, a general process of if you have a lot of outstanding reservations and basically if you were to go belly up right at that point, then we're not, not only responsible for the 6% booking fee, but we're technically the underwriter for all those future transactions. So I remember working with you on this and we basically wanted to make sure that we had some sort of capital to make sure that if you were to you know, stop providing services that basically $75,000 of chargebacks wouldn't come directly onto us. So I think we, we, worked, we worked this out. You were a very unique case because of the, uh, the situation, but it, no, there's no holding bookings hostage. I think this is a standard practice in the industry. When you have a lot of outstanding bookings, it's just, it's tough when you're uh, the underwriter for, the, for your future bookings. It, it didn't seem like it was an isolated case, perhaps from some of the applause, Max. I, I think that you know, there's, there's definitely a perception that, that I hear from suppliers around it, you guys being a, a tougher business to, to switch. I mean, you know, w whether to our own sort of detriment, um, it's a pretty easy switch out from a check front or a, or a peak or from, from a ResD. Whereas I think, you know, Google Analytics data, your, your website, there's a whole bunch of things that I think make it um, you know, a much harder exercise to leave Fair Harbor and, and you know, probably why you've been so successful in terms of growth. Yeah, I mean, I, I think also, if you think about it, Basically, when you are switching a reservation software, it's in our best interest to have that be a nice, seamless exit. And I'm sure that there are some people in the audience who have left Fair Harbor and have come back and can probably speak to that experience. That was an isolated case of you know, a very tough situation. I think we resolved it to your satisfaction. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm so not. I, It was resolved. I, this, this maybe some still some some ill will, but it, it was resolved to her satisfaction. My the best. So we, so we so we run over. So we're, we're out of time. But I have one one final question. 
I'd like to go down, down the line. Um, this is a one that was submitted from an attendee in advance, and I would like a yes or no answer. Uh, Chris, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, so the question is, salespeople, so this is an operator talking about salespeople from reservation systems. Salespeople in the sector spend a lot of time criticizing competitors. Often it's not nice. Will each of you commit to directing your sales team to focus on their own products and stop dissing competitors? I think we do that already. I don't think we. I don't think that's something that you find when people deal with Resty. Uh, and I'd be surprised if that was a criticism that was that was um, reflected on our teams. I mean, we have 90 plus percent of the conversations our sales team have are inbound. You know, we're not calling people every uh, Thursday morning at 11 o'clock. Um, and so, uh, you know, we continue to to operate the way that we want to, which is to work with the supplier to give them, as I talked about before, um, the answers that they need to make a good decision around the right software. Ms. Wana. Absolutely, we completely agree with that. I think there have been a couple of players that have behaved quite badly in the industry, and I think it's not good for everyone else involved. And so that's always been the message for our sales team for many years, and it's really, really important to us to have that. Jason? 100%, yeah, we're, we're very value-driven in that regard. Um, and I think all of us have each other's contacts, numbers, and cell phones, and, and we will sometimes trade things when there's a bad actor in a sales team, but. It's not fair to the operators, and it makes us all look bad. And it has to come from us. Max? Yeah, 100%. I mean, it's, I started our sales team and helped grow it and made all the foundational things that we do. And we are 100% above board. And that's, that's no way to get ahead by you know, dissing somebody else. So unacceptable. And if, if, if it comes up, you know, let us know. Email our COO, ted, at fairharbor.com, and we'll take care of it. Ladies and gentlemen. Max, Jason, Rizwana, Chris, thank you.